Good morning. morning. Well, before I start, uh, would you bow your heads with me? I just feel God wants us to just meet with him for just a a moment here. Lord, I I just thank you and I praise you for for every every life that is here, every soul that is represented. I, I pray, Father God, for every ear to be open, for every eye to see every word of yours. Father God, I I pray, Lord, that our minds can be on you. Not on what what happened yesterday, not what's going to happen today, not even on myself. Lord, take the fear out of the lives of people that would take you away from their word. Away from your word, Lord. We just thank you in, in advance for all that your word is going to accomplish here today. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. And Amen. Hey, listen, if you were asked the most important thing that we have been given as the church of Jesus Christ, um, how would you respond? Hopefully it wouldn't take you very long or, or too many ways that you would guess before determining that the Word of God is our most valuable possession. And for many reasons. My goal today is to challenge you. To begin looking at the Word of God in a more broader sense, maybe than you ever have before. I'm not interested in changing your view of Scripture, no, but to expand your view. Now, first of all, we know that the Word of God has been established from eternity past. Nothing can ever change that. Man can restructure it, man can add to it, man can subtract from it, which is not a good idea. Man can pervert it, he can distort it, he can improperly interpret it, and man can use it for ill-gotten gain. However, God's Word will remain complete, it will remain intact, and it will remain eternal. uh, Luke 21, 33, Jesus' own words. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will never pass away. You know, when someone speaks of the Word of God, most of the time it's in reference to this book that we call the Bible. And that, and that that would be true. Written on the pages of this book is the Word of God. In a nutshell, the Bible reveals what God wants His people to know. That's what the Bible is. It reveals what God wants his people to know. Well, what does really, truly God want his people to know? Very simply, God wants us to know him. God's ultimate goal for us, his creation, is that through his word, we can come to know who he is. Now stay with me. Not know about him, no. But know him. God doesn't want us to simply learn information about him, who he is. Maybe make a list of things that he has done. No. God's desire for all of his creation is to know him personally. Not a whole lot differently from the way we know a spouse or a parent or a friend. God wants us to have the knowledge of him that a personal and an intimate relationship with someone could allow. It's not God's desire that after we, we read his word, we'd be able to write an essay about him. No, that's, that's merely an intellectual understanding. That's not what God is after. God wants to introduce us to his heart, his desires, his emotions. He wants us to sense and understand his character. He wants to make us aware that through this relationship that we have with him, he has plans for us. Our Heavenly Father wants us to know that just as he had plans for the ancients, Abraham and David and and the Apostle Paul, the, the God of creation has today, right now, plans for you and for me. This is one of the miracles that's found in the Word of God. It's timeless. It's forever relative. While it applied to the to ancient Israel and it applied to the first century church, today, right now, it applies to the people of God. It's almost as if the Word of God is dynamically alive and pulsating. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Hebrews 4.12. The Word of God is living. The Word of God is active. Now, the Word of God is not written for everyone. No. 
It's a word written expressively for the people of God. Now why do I say that? Because except for the people of God, it cannot be understood. Not for the purpose in which it was written, it can't. And the reason is, is that the word of God is spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2, 11 and 12. No one can know a person's thought except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit. Not the world's spirit. So that we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. That, that is a miracle in itself. You know that you can know the heart of God. You can know the mind of God. Why? Because we share the same spirit of God. And that spirit reveals to us the revelation of God. Anyone can read the word. That's true. But to everyone not a member of the family of God, to everyone who is not possessing the Spirit of God, it would read like a textbook. And think of it in, in this term, in this, this analogy. If those outside Christ were to go and try to get a copy of God's Word, let's say they go to Barnes and Nobles, for example, and they want to get the Word of God, they would have to walk over to the reference section. That's where the textbooks are. That's where words are of, of almanacs and manuals and fact-finding compilations. But no, the people of God, nah, that's different here. We go to Barnes and Nobles. You know where we go? Right to the romance section. Why? Because the Word of God is a love story of monumental proportions to the people of God. The greatest love story ever compiled. John 3.16 God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. One way to look at the Bible is that it's an autobiography describing the bottomless depths of God's love for us. Amen. See, Paul knew that love. Paul wanted us to know that love. And so Paul prayed for us that we would come to know one day that same love. Ephesians 3, 16 to 18. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Amen. Agape love. Found in here. Only found in the word of God unconditional. We don't find it in the world. That's, that's, it's not the love that God is talking about. One of the things that makes the Word of God so unique is that this Bible, this Word of God, is not just about God, but it's also written by God. 2 Timothy 3.16 All Scripture is God-breathed. God-breathed. Theonoustos is the Greek term. Theonoustos is, is God breathed. It means inspired by God. God intuitively informed the writers of what he wanted. And then God spiritually stimulated and motiv motivated them to carry it out. God provided not only the what, but God provided the how. The Bible is the story God authored about himself which contains an incredibly inspired message to every child of his who reads it. And what is God's message to man? Here is where we begin to shift our thinking. This is what I want you to grab hold of here this morning. God's message to mankind is not a what. It's not what is God's message to his people. It's a who. Who is God's message to his people. You see, if we think it only in terms of God's message being a what, we can easily fragment into individual views and opinions. We could get caught up in one idea. We could build a whole theology around a couple of verses of Scripture. We go on tangents. And that can easily get us off track, divide us from one another, and, and become for us overwhelming. What's essential? What's not? How can I learn all this? I can't. How can I make sense of all this? How can I apply all of this to my own life? 
Those are just some reasons why, why people quit reading or never start reading the Bible. I've been there. So have you. To truly unlock the Word of God and come to absorb it as God desires us, we have to shift our thinking away from what does God want me to understand and instead begin asking the question, who does God want me to understand? Instead of what words or what messages are important, our goal becomes who is important. So this morning, I'm proposing to you that we take instruction from the Apostle John, the, the one that Jesus truly loved, and begin to see the Word of God as he saw him. So let's go. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Now this scripture is not referring to a message or messages that God wants us to memorize and interpret. This scripture is very plainly and very obviously referring to Jesus Christ, God, the second person of the Trinity. Brothers and sisters, the Word of God, the Word of God is God. The message of God is God. Verse 14 out of John 1, the, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. To get God's people to embrace God's message Here's what he did. God became one of us. What better way for us to understand his message than for his message to take the form of us and to live among us. A living message. A living word. And let me add here that from the very beginning of time, of creation, it's been God's desire and his plan to dwell with his creation. Starting in the garden. Where he actually did in the cool of the day. Then he directed his people to build a tabernacle in the wilderness. Why? So he could dwell in that tabernacle among them. And later, instructions that he gave to build a temple in the holy city where God dwelt between the cherubim in the holy of holies. And then for 33 years, coming to earth personally, wrapped in flesh, Emmanuel, he lived among us. As man, the son of man. And we learn that not only has that been God's desire, but it will be God's desire for all eternity. The book of Revelation. Now, the dwelling. Now. Now meaning when the new heaven and the new earth appear. When the war is over, we know it's won, right? But when the war is over, now, the dwelling of God is with men. This is eternal. And he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. God has been pursuing us from the moment of the fall. And he's using his own word. Here's who I am. Here's what I want you. Here, here's how I want you. And here's, here's who I want you to be. Here's how I want to bring you back with me. It's going to be through my word. Jesus Jesus, the living Word. See, no one comes to the Father except through the Word. Now, when I began looking at the Word of God as, as who and not what, I saw a lot of Scripture more clearly defined for me. Truths that maybe I, I had some difficulty grasping entirely. Those, those have become much more applicable. Here's one. Hebrews 4.12. I read it. The Word of God is living and active. The Word, Jesus Christ, certainly is alive. We celebrated, right, three weeks ago, the empty tomb. We know that. And yes, He's actively working on our behalf as I speak. Look at Romans 8.34. Christ Jesus, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. Here's another one. The Word of God. Judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Yes, he's the judge. 2 Timothy 4.1 In the presence of God and of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. Brothers and sisters, very simply put, the word of God is God revealed. The word of God is God uncovered. It is revelation of the one who was and is and who will forever be. They are one and the same. 
You cannot separate God from his word. That's why this book is unlike any other book ever written. Because it's an, it's an active and ever-producing revelation of God. Read it today, you learn about God. You read it tomorrow, you learn more about God. And the next day, and the next day, and the next day. It's a continual revelation of who God is. It's because God is continually revealing himself through his living and active word. And regardless of how long you live or, or how astute you become in your life, you could never outlive learning new revelation of God to the very last day. That's why this book is so adored. And it's also why this book is so despised. It's, it's adored by all who receive the living word, Christ. Why? Because from it, our lives can experience peace and joy and love and comfort and compassion and courage. All the things that God himself truly is. And at the same time, the enemy despises it because it is the revelation of God. The enemy of God knows the power that is found when people discover who God truly is through their relationship with Christ who is the living word. The enemy doesn't want people experiencing that. They don't want us to come in, in, into the revelation of who God truly is. No. And for the hundredth time, the enemy of God is not people. I mean, what mere person, if left to himself without the influence of the devil, would hate or disagree with Scripture? Maybe mentally deranged people. So let's start with the Ten Commandments. Don't lie, don't cheat on your spouse, and steal from others. Love your enemy, give generously, pray for one another, don't judge, encourage those who need to be encouraged, assist orphans and widows. I mean, seriously. Who has a problem with that? See, people themselves, they don't hate the Bible. However, the unseen, demonic spirits who are leading and in charge of this world have a big problem with it. It's the forces of evil, the powers of this dark world, who recognize that the Word of God is a whole lot more than wise sayings and helpful advice. The enemy knows that contained between Genesis and Revelation is Christ himself. The full revelation of God. And the last thing God's enemy wants is for people to receive that revelation. Why? Well, their lives are changed. They're eternal beings in the kingdom of God. That's why the enemy is doing everything within its power to do away with the word of God right here in this country. <laughs> Can't have it on your desk at work. Might cause you to, I don't know, encourage too many people. Can't be visible at any government offices or in the school. Wouldn't want kids to learn that selfishness and greed are bad. Can't read from it at public forums. Somebody might actually end up being moved to help people in need. Perish the thought. This is a calculated move of the enemy. To rid the earth of God. Good luck with that. It's also why laws in this country are being made which fly in the face of Scripture. See, if the enemy can now prosecute people who teach and preach certain aspects of the Bible, then people will get too intimidated to even open it, to read it. People who might just come to receive a revelation of God through it. So the enemy works to suppress with fear, just like he does in every oppressive Muslim nation. Listen, our lives don't become transformed by reading words on a page. Our lives become transformed by having a personal relationship with the living word himself. And the living word himself can be discovered in here. See, the disciples proved that just the knowledge of God is not enough. Let's take a look at what Jesus said to Philip in John 14. If you really know me, you will, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus, Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. 
After three and a half years of a physical relationship, Philip might have known Jesus the man, but he didn't know Jesus as the revelation of God. He, as well as all the other disciples, still needed to have that intellectual relationship taken to the next level, which it was at Pentecost, when God himself entered their lives in spirit form. Jesus previously told them this was coming, this was going to happen. Acts 1, 4, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised. In a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then, he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And then you will be my witnesses. It wasn't until their spiritual transformation that the word of God set within them came alive. And enabled them to become witnesses. Testifying messengers of the power of God. That's no different from us. The words we read in scripture will be mere words. And nothing more until we too have received power from on high. And become spiritually transformed as well. You see for me I, I, I can't understand denominations or churches who never teach salvation. The way to eternal life is God in them. Every Sunday gatherings upon gatherings of assemblies. Who never offer opportunities for people to like Romans 10.9 tells us, confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Hallelujah. Then you'll be saved. Amen. I mean, isn't salvation the point to all of this? Right? It's the point to all of this. Anything outside of that, we're coming here just meeting together. There's no power in that. I mean, isn't that why the word of life came to us? John 3, 17, For God has sent His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. To save the world. That's why Christ came. That's what this book is all about. Christ coming to us to save us. The word is Him. We could have an intellectual relationship with God. We can espouse fact upon fact upon fact about God. But we will never be able to communicate God's word with power. No, not the power that transforms lives and takes people from the graveside of spiritual death into the glory of God's eternal kingdom. No, not until God bursts his spirit within us as he did those at Pentecost. Listen, this, this really isn't rocket science. God's plan to save the world is not encrypted in a minutia of do's and don'ts. God's plan to save the world is a love story entitled Jesus the Living Word. See, every time we read this, we better see Him. Because this is Him. He's in every word. The Living Word, Christ. And go, don't get thrown off base. Don't let the enemy overwhelm you or confuse you. See, remember, the devil loves using Scripture. He loves to pervert it. He loves to misquote it. And he especially loves compromising it. That's why for me, I've chosen to stand on the Word of God. On the eternal Word of God. This is the foundation of God. This is, this is where God speaks to us. This is where we receive. When we are standing on the Word of God, Christ, then we can be all that God has called us to be. The Word of God is so powerful and relevant and eternal. Why? Because the Word of God is God who is powerful and relevant and eternal. The Word of God will speak to you. The key is... The people of God, are we listening? Are we obeying? Hmm. That's what we have to answer. I truly, I truly believe that in my lifetime, that standing here on the foundation of the Word of God, living my life by the Word of God, 
Every line of the Word of God. Espousing that, teaching that, preaching that, living that, I believe in my lifetime it will cause one to be arrested. Are you prepared for that? Is your relationship with the living Word, is your foundation built here? Is this where everything in your life is built from the Word of God, Christ, our foundation? Is it so strong? Are, are, you, are you so intimate, so personal with Him, that even, even the threat of going to jail won't change you? Won't change that? Will not get you to do this? Or get you to do this? Which we love to do, don't we? Foot in the kingdom, a foot in the world. No. It's got to be in the kingdom. See, this is the kingdom. Living by the word of God is the kingdom. The kingdom has come. Nick has taught us the kingdom has come. The kingdom is here. Here's where I live in God's kingdom. This is not the kingdom of God. It's everything but the kingdom of God. This is eternal God's kingdom. We're going to be persecuted. You're not going to be, you're not going to be championed a hero standing here. Living here. On the foundation of God's word. On, on Christ who he is. And let me tell you something. To stay here. It's going to take a lot of faith. Where do you suppose. That faith is going to come from. Faith. Right. You put it up. Faith comes from hearing. And hearing by what? The Word of God. That's where it's going to come from. So we're going to be standing here for, I don't know, at least next week. Maybe the week after. Because we're going to continue to learn what standing here in the kingdom of God is going to do for us. Would you pray with me? Father, I, my prayer is that you keep us. That we, that we are intentional about staying in the kingdom. About standing on your word. About building anything in our lives from the foundation, Lord. And building on anything else is, is Father, is, is temporary. It's going to go away. It's going to get burned up. But anything we build on your foundation, Lord, is acceptable in your eyes. Father, we want to help you we want to help you. We want to come alongside of wherever you're building this kingdom. And we want to help you, Lord. But Father, we've got, to, we've got to do it from the kingdom. We can't help from outside the kingdom. In the kingdom, Lord. People want to intimidate us with fear. People want to intimidate us with, with all kinds of things. But Father, your word stands true. I can stand on every word that I read in Scripture, because that means I'm standing on you. Standing on the promises that God has made to us. So, Father, thank you. Thank you that when I read your word, I read about this love story that you have for me, that you are pursuing me, that you want me to share in this kingdom with you. Thank you, Father. What joy fills my heart. That there's nothing on this, on this planet, Lord, that I want besides you. That there's nothing that man can do to me that you can't undo. So, Father, we rejoice in your presence. We praise you for the God that you are. I thank you for this, this love. God so loves me that he sent his one and only son. Let us see that. Let us come to know that. Let us espouse that. And let us live that. In Christ's name we pray. And everybody said. Amen. Amen.